way we did it, and the way you have to do it, is first you have to define the parameters that you're going to evaluate. Uh, and to do that, we convened a conference. We, we took all the members of the advisory council, we locked them up in a hotel outside London for the weekend, and we got them to write on post-its every possible harm they could imagine or think a drug could do. And there were about 3,000 of these post-its, and we stuck them on the wall. And the next day, we sorted them. We sorted them into uh, the minimum number of variables. And it turned out that it came down to 16 separate variables. And I'll show you them on the next slide. And then we spent the remainder of that conference working out how to define each of the variables. Because without definitions, it's very hard to do the ratings. Uh, it, this was published um, on the Home Office website uh, subsequently. And here is what we call a decision tree. So this shows the nine harms that drugs can do to users and the seven harms that drugs can do to others or to society. What you see there are the the way in which the, the, there are two, these two, the nine harms to the user, the seven harms to society, and how they build in the decision tree. And, uh, and the challenge then is to evaluate the harm of any given drug on all those 16 different parameters. And some of them are pretty straightforward. Some of them are, are parameters that we have good data on. We have, for instance, parameters on deaths. And here you have deaths from uh, alcohol, tobacco, well, tobacco on the left, alcohol, in the UK, showing that tobacco's way the largest killer, with alcohol second, opiates third, and drugs like cannabis and ecstasy and uh, mushrooms very, very low in terms of uh, the likelihood of causing death. But another way of looking at uh, death is to look at the likelihood of any particular drug causing death. And this was an analysis done by Les King, who was one of the key members of this committee. Uh, and uh, he estimated the likelihood of dying any time anyone used a particular drug. And he came to this very clear conclusion that heroin, and uh, of course fentanyls, and would now be uh, categorized alongside heroin, as way, way more harmful. One in 20 people who ever use an opiate die of an opiate. Much, much more likely to kill you than any other drug. So that's one example, drug-specific mortality, the likelihood of a drug killing you any time you use that drug. But here's another variable we looked at, drug-related damage. The damage that using a drug might do because of the way you use it. It's a rather graphic and horrible image from the streets of Lahore showing a, a young Pakistani boy being injected by another um, Pakistani boy. And of course, we know that there's a strong relationship between injecting drug use and bloodborne viruses. But there's also, in, also relationships with other di disorders. And in Britain, outbreaks of anthrax and clostridia are very often associated with the um, use of heroin that's come from Afghanistan. Another variable we looked at is drug-related mortality the likelihood of dying as a result of just using the drug, how the drug damages the body. And here's some graphic examples. On the left-hand side, you see lung cancer. On the right-hand side, you see cirrhosis. Chronic use of tobacco and alcohol eventually can destroy organs in the body and lead to death. And tobacco is a, a particularly, well, it is the leading cause, uh, certainly, of self-inflicted death in the world because Smoking tobacco influences so many different systems that it's uh, a major factor in cardiovascular death and lung death and also cancer. And as I showed you this morning, those of you who were uh, awake then, that alcohol is becoming, for young people, the leading cause of death in Britain. And I, I bet the same is true in Australia if you generated that data. So it's the leading cause of death in men under the age of 20. It's overtaken suicide, road traffic accidents, and cancer. And it will be the leading cause of death in women under 50 within a few years, because women are drinking more than men now. So alcohol, in, ter uh, in population terms, is a massive problem. And I just wanted to show you this graph. Now, 
You're not at the top of the world drinking ranks, say the Russia and the Eastern European countries at the top of the graph are, but you're in the second tier, and what you want to do is go down rather than up that particular um, league. But also note Africa, and I just show this. I show this when I, I, I give, I speak, I teach on the Imperial College Global Health Course. They get one lecture on addiction. And in that lecture, I say to them, you're all in your 20s. By the time you get to my age, we will have eliminated malaria, dengue fever, tuberculosis, meningitis. I mean, it's almost inconceivable we won't. And what will we be left with? Addictions. So it's really important you learn about addictions. And uh, most of them, of course, switch off at that point. But the reality is global health, in the end, is going to be about addiction and mental health. We're not just interested in death, we're also interested in mental impairments. Sometimes they do lead to death. And here's a rather interesting example of uh, someone whose decision making was impaired by alcohol. This is uh, um, Professor Campbell, who might have got the Nobel Prize. He was one of the co-inventors uh, of Dolly, the first cloned uh, sheep. And uh, he killed himself when he, he was drunk. His wife, uh, sorry, his girlfriend was angry with him, so he went uh, outside into the garden and hung himself. And um, it's quite an interesting example of the kind of impulsivity that leads people to harm when they're drunk. But I also thought it's really important for people to understand how we treat alcohol, or the media treat alcohol differently from other drugs, because the media reported his death as this. He was a regular drinker, which I think we would understand as an alcoholic, but we need to mollify people so that they don't feel we're being critical to him, who suffered from hypertension, high blood pressure, and a heart condition, all of which were probably related to his death. But it was the impairment of mental function that led to his death, not those other illnesses or symptoms. And here's another interesting example of how alcohol changes people's lives. This is what an MP in Britain, one of the few MPs that had actually done anything in his life before becoming an MP. He was a soldier, fought in Afghanistan, became an MP, got drunk one night, was insulted by a Tory MP, he's a Labour MP, and he nutted the Tory, and since then he's no longer an MP. His career is over because he lost control. And uh, so that's an example of uh, the impairment again. But there are also social damage from drugs, and we've already heard today about uh, people cre creating crystal meths in garages, and sometimes they can blow up, and there's local pollution. But the biggest ever environmental disaster before the Gulf oil spill was this one. This is the Exxon Valdez. The captain was drunk. He drove into the coast of Alaska and wiped out the, the, the flora and fauna of about a thousand miles of Alaskan coast. That's a very big environmental cost from drinking. And of course there's violence. In Britain it cost the economy twice as much to deal with alcohol-induced violence, 6.6 .6 billion a year as it does to deal with alcohol health costs, 3.5 billion. And that's because alcohol creates violence even if you're at Ascot, even if you're wearing a very, very posh outfit. <laughs> and I just also want to emphasize, just look at the bottom there. You see the person's hand at the bottom, he's holding a champagne bottle. And a champagne bottle is an extremely dangerous weapon. If you hit someone on the head with a champagne bottle, the skull will break before the bottle does. And actually, alcohol-induced violence is an enormous challenge uh, to society. <laughs>